Hello and welcome to Arizona DUI Services 16-hour DUI education course. My name is Paul Fernandez. I am the CEO of Arizona DUI Services and I want to thank you for choosing Arizona DUI Services to complete your treatment or your education. We do appreciate your support. And before we start to move forward, I want to go ahead and address something. I have had clients in the past reach out to me via email or telephone calls and they tell me that, hey, I had a DUI for alcohol and you cover a lot of information in your 16 hour course and your treatment courses that really isn't necessarily relevant to me. To that, I have to say that the content that we created is based off the of criteria that the Arizona Department of Health Services has asked us to cover. So I'm not trying to keep you here any longer. I'm not trying to um, give you some information that you don't think is relevant. I'm merely following the criteria that was set before me. Now, that being said, there is a lot of good information in this course, and I hope that as you complete this course, you're going to learn some new things that you're going to find interesting, as well as be reminded of those things that you knew but you may have forgotten. So that being said, this is the 16-hour DUI education course. There are five modules. This is the very first module. In this module, we're going to cover the physiological effects of drugs and alcohol. We are going to cover the brain, the physiological effects of alcohol, opioids, amphetamines, cocaine, as well as cannabis. Now, the first thing we're going to cover is the brain. Uh, our brain is the most vital of all our organs. It controls our involuntary as well as our voluntary movements. Now, our involuntary movements are automatic movements. We don't necessarily have to think about them to make them occur. And some of the involuntary or automatic movements include heartbeats, breathing, digestion, as well as regulating our body temperature. And our voluntary movements, these are mainly the actions of our thoughts. So when we think about reading, our brain is going to find the book it wants to read, it's going to tell our arm to extend and our hand to grab. We have the book and then we're going to start reading. Those are the voluntary movements. Now, the definitive function of the brain is actually to preserve its own existence. Some examples of this is if the brain feels there's imminent danger, it's going to trigger your fight or flight response. So you're either going to run from that danger or you're going to be ready to fight. If your brain feels that it's the brain itself or its body needs any sort of nourishment, it's going to trigger hunger pains. So that's one way it preserves its existence. Another way is the brain uses what is called the reward system or, or what people call the pleasure system and it uses this again to ensure its existence. Now, behaviors such as social bonding, eating, and reproduction are naturally rewarded by the brain as they support human survival and again, its own existence. The brain ensures survival through a pleasure response facilitated by neurotransmitters. Some of these neurotransmitters are like serotonin, dopamine, GABA, and oxytocin. In total, there are 100 different neurotransmitters. And dopamine is the neurotransmitter most commonly associated with alcohol and drug use. And you'll hear dopamine throughout these next couple of modules. The brain's prefrontal cortex is essential in developing our values, our personality, self-awareness, problem solving, social skills, as well as critical thinking. These are what experts consider your brain's executive functions. Now, again, to ensure its existence, the brain uses the process, these are these executive functions, to navigate as it goes through this world. So let's go ahead and break down a few of these executive functions. The first one I want to look at is critical thinking. Critical thinking is our ability to gather internal and external information and accurately, effectively, and completely understand the information leading to a set of beliefs. The beliefs that you develop are going to be compared to a universal benchmark, and this universal benchmark of beliefs is consistent, relevant, and sound in reason. And so an example of that, let's say that someone believes that murder, not, not self-defense, but actually just going out there and killing somebody is okay. So if someone believes that, what they can do then is measure that against the universal benchmark. And, and there's nowhere in the world that says that murder is good. So this person's critical thinking skills are inadequate. Somewhere along the line, they didn't gather the right information. They didn't process it properly. Something happened for them to believe that murder was okay. Alcohol and substance use have been identified as opponents to optimal critical thinking. So that when we use drugs and alcohol, Critical thinking skills are not adequate. Next, we're going to look at problem solving. Problem solving is our ability to identify and understand the complexity 
of our real challenges to develop and apply the most effective solution to our problems. Effective problem solvers will be capable of recognizing the correct challenge and then avoid spending time working on issues that are secondary to the real problem. So we live in a world where we have social media, we have the news, we have radio, we have friends, we have family, that there's a lot of things coming at us. Now, we have to be able to, for good problem solvers, block out that white noise that's around us. And so being centered on the correct problem is going to help us generate alternatives and ultimately apply an effective resolution to our problem. Again, alcohol and substance use have been identified as opponents to optimal problem solving. When we drink and use drugs, we are not very good at solving problems. Next, we're going to cover social skills, which are skills of communication through verbal and nonverbal cues to make social connections. We are humans, we are instinctively social beings and develop methods to share our ideas as well as our emotions. Our message is then delivered through tone, the volume of our speech, the words that we select, our posture and our emotions, again, verbal and nonverbal cues. Social skills are critical to building strong relationships, being understood and accepted, as well as our influence and happiness. Alcohol and substance use, again, have been identified as opponents to developing healthy social skills. There it is again, alcohol and substance use, preventing us from being effective at what we need for in those executive functions. Now, problems with critical thinking, problem solving, and social skills are exasperated when the alcohol and substance use becomes chronic. To achieve the high that we get from alcohol or drugs, alcohol or drugs, they are, are what they do is they manipulate your brain's natural reward system. The inconsistency of rewarding poor behavior then conflicts with our prefrontal cortex's design and purpose, which is its own existence. An overwhelmed prefrontal cortex is then constrained to process information properly. So when we are using drugs or drinking alcohol, our executive functions aren't optimal, and it gives our prefrontal cortex a bit of an issue. It's a challenge to it. Essentially what happens is alcohol and substances, they are going to hijack your brain's natural reward system. And they're going to start to use it for its own purpose. So instead of for its own existence, it's going to start to use it so that you're doing more drugs and alcohol. An overwhelmed prefrontal cortex is challenged to function optimally, leaving your critical thinking vulnerable in identifying, assessing, and then resolving internal and external stimuli. When using alcohol or substances, our executive functions like judgment, reasoning, or hygiene become challenged and often inadequate. Finally, our motor skills are delayed and diminished partly due to the slower processing of external stimuli. So, Essentially, what happens is the first thing that's going to go when we start using drugs and alcohol is going to be our judgment. It's going to be our, how our brain executes those executive functions. Now, you're going to see some slides here throughout the modules, relevant information, important information, things to remember. And essentially, I know you saw some of this when you were taking the pretest, and you're definitely going to see some of this as you take the final because the pretest and the final are the same thing. So remember some of this if you didn't get a 70% on the pretest. The first thing is the brain processes internal and external stimuli to preserve your existence. The brain's reward system encourages and repeats survival behaviors, safeguarding its existence. Dopamine is a chemical released in the brain, producing a pleasure response used to encourage survival behavior. And substance use and chronic use hijack your organic reward system, a naturally rewarding destructive behavior. Again, it's going to hijack it. Your prefrontal cortex is then conflicted. There's going to be some issues, and that's from drug and alcohol use. Now let's go ahead and take a look at the physiological effects of alcohol. After consuming alcohol, the body is going to convert it into ethanol. And some common uses or some common things ethanol is going to be found in are gasoline additives. I'm sure you've been at the pump and it shows you whatever percentage of ethanol is in the gas. It's in hairspray, nail polish, as well as hand sanitizer. And the reason that I'm bringing this up is because I want you to understand that by consuming alcohol, essentially you're simply poisoning yourself. After all, it's called intoxication, right? Toxic is right in the middle of it. So when people drink too much and they get sick and they throw up, 
that's because they've poisoned themselves to the point where the body's trying to get rid of the poison. Or when people wake up and they have hangovers, that's because you've poisoned yourself the night before. So remember, as you drink, you're essentially poisoning your body. Now, the short-term effects of alcohol include mood enhancements, calming, as well as euphoria. Conversely, alcohol is going to depress your brain as well as your central nervous system. It's going to delay cognitive function as well as motor skills, impair your judgment, and it's going to affect your impulse control. As you can see on this slide, this gentleman has no impulse control. He's got a tie on his head. Alcohol affects the brain on several levels. First, alcohol affects our judgment by diminishing our ability to process the internal as well as external information properly. Your inability, our inability to accurately analyze stimuli results in poor emotional control, impulse control, as well as bad judgment. And these things lead to risky behavior. And I think we can all agree that driving while we're intoxicated is risky behavior. And again, when we drink, the very first thing that's gonna go is gonna be your judgment. And because judgment is the first ability to be impaired, many people actually drive drunk because they simply don't understand they're too drunk to drive, and that's because their judgment has been impaired because of the alcohol. After your judgment is impaired, alcohol then starts to affect our motor skills. Since our judgment is impaired, we have problems properly identifying potential hazards, which limits our reaction time to those hazards. Also, the depressant-like effects alcohol has on our brain is going to slow our ability to send timely communications from our brain to our extremities. These delays slow our average response time, impairing our motor skills and leaving you vulnerable to the unexpected. Research has found a connection between alcohol and the brain's ability to create memories. And that connection is that Alcohol negatively affects the hippocampus, which is responsible for creating memories. So we see this when people black out. So if you've ever been out with somebody or some friends or a group of friends and you were heavily drinking, the next day when you're talking to them and you're kind of, man, like, do you remember this happened? Or I can't believe that. Do you remember seeing that? If your friends are telling you, no, I, I really don't remember that, that's because the brain has an, I'm sorry, alcohol has a negative impact on the hippocampus of your brain, which is responsible for memories. They essentially, they blacked out. They were there, but they weren't there. Researchers believe that the gray matter in your brain is associated with intelligence. So on this slide, you can see the gray matter of the brain as it's split open on that, that model. And research also has proven that chronic alcohol use can reduce your brain's gray matter, essentially shrinking your brain and possibly your IQ. Obviously, if they think the gray matter is associated with intelligence and that gray matter shrinks, the IQ, you would assume, is going to also shrink. Alcohol also leaves hearts susceptible to tachycardia. Tachycardia is when the lower chamber of your heart is beating so fast that it, it can't adequately pump blood through your system. And in turn, the body's not going to receive enough oxygenated blood, and this is causing high blood pressure, increased risk of heart attack, as well as stroke. And on this slide, you can see that the top is the, the rhythm of a normal heart, and that's actually pretty cool looking. And then right below that is the tachycardia, and you can see that there's some very big differences between the two. Alcohol also is going to um, irritate the lining of your stomach, which is then going to increase your probability of having an ulcer, gastritis, and chronic alcohol use may also lead to a swollen pancreas with inflamed blood vessels, which is a painful issue known as pancreatitis. This also pancreatitis is going to interfere with your digestive process, leading to malnourishment. Alcohol also obstructs the liver's ability to rid itself of fat, leading to a fatty liver and restricting your liver's job of filtering toxins from the blood. So you can see on the left is a healthy liver and on the right is a fatty liver. You can see the differences. Now, once your liver is fatty, it's going to have trouble overcoming viral infections like hepatitis. That's the most common one is hepatitis, which can lead to fibrosis and eventually to cirrhosis, which is scar tissue forming on the liver. Cirrhosis is a chronic illness, and you can see this liver, it's not smooth. You can see the, the lumps on it, which is actually the scarring of the liver. And again, this is cirrhosis, and this is a chronic illness. Now, smokers are especially susceptible to esophageal illness as the smoke initially irritates the esophagus and then is further irritated as you consume alcohol. 
esophageal cancer obviously is going to be most associated with um, chronic alcohol users who are smokers. Now the human body is an intelligently designed organism which is continually working towards a homeostasis or an internal equilibrium. In a homeostasis state, all of our organs are performing at optimal levels, which then in turn produces wellness and good health. Now, the damage that alcohol has on our bodies, particularly our organs, is going to interfere with us reaching the homeostasis state, which also again produces good health as well as wellness. So alcohol is going to prevent this from happening. When homeostasis is interrupted by alcohol use, Healthy organs are going to start to work harder to counterbalance the underperforming organs. This is going to lead to additional health problems, as well as when the natural function of the liver and the pancreas are constricted, the natural detoxification process is then challenged. So the liver isn't and the pancreas are unable to rid the body of its toxins, and then this is going to lead to a buildup of toxins within the body. Now, over time, as these toxins continue to build up, the uh, probability of a cancer diagnosis is then going to increase. Chronic alcohol use is associated with mouth, throat, esophagus, liver, colon, rectal, and breast cancers. That's because we are unable to rid our bodies of these toxins. Next, let's go ahead and take a look at the physiological effects of opioids. Now, in the short term, opioids are going to enhance your ability to handle pain by depressing your central nervous system and triggering a dopamine response 200 to 1,000 times your natural levels. Now, remember, dopamine is that neurotransmitter that the brain uses to encourage healthy behaviors. Opioids take that response, that dopamine response, and they jack it up 200 to 1,000 times its natural levels. Short-term consequences of opioid use include impaired motor skills and judgment, painful withdrawal symptoms, lower respirations, compromised cognitive function, high levels of tolerance, and addiction. According to the National Institute of Drug Abuse, 75% of people entering treatment for opioid addiction started with the prescription. Extended opioid use leads to tolerance, which in turn leads to larger doses to reach the desired high. Larger doses to minimize your withdrawal symptoms, increased dependency, and an increased risk of overdose. From 2019 to 2021, opioid overdose has increased 49%. More than 106,000 Americans overdosed in 2021 from opioids. When opioid use becomes chronic, the user will experience mood disorders like fatigue and major depression, gastrointestinal issues related to constipation, pain sensitivity is then heightened. Remember, when we first start, when people first start using opioids, it depresses your brain and your central nervous system, doling you to pain. As you become a chronic user of opioids, your pain sensitivity is heightened, so it has a, a, an opposite effect. Your motor function can become sluggish and your immune system becomes compromised, making it easier for you to become sick. Chronic users may also experience heartburn, nausea, vomiting. Liver damage is common in intravenous opioid users. Cardiac issues resulting in low blood pressure, breathing complications, contributing to cardiac arrest and heart failure, as well as accidental overdose. So that is chronic opioid users. Those are some of the things that they're going to experience. Now, some things to remember about opioids. Again, you may see this or you will see this on the final exam. Opioids increase your natural dopamine levels 200 to 1,000 times its natural occurring levels, making opioids highly addictive. Chronic use increases the user's sensitivity to pain. Intense withdrawal systems, um, symptoms lead to increased dosages as well as extended periods of use and accidental overdose is a major concern for opioid users. Now let's take a look at the physiological effects of amphetamines. Amphetamines work as a stimulant to the brain and the central nervous system. Short-term effects of amphetamine use include a sense of well-being as well as improved performance. However, the initial effects of amphetamines quickly turn into consequences as the users will start to experience increased heart rate, increased blood pressure and hyperthermia, as well as insomnia, altered sexual behavior, and an increased potential for addiction. 
As amphetamine use continues, users can experience greater consequences. Juice persists, users will become malnourished and have persistent dry mouth and grinding of the teeth. This leads to obvious dental problems. Amphetamine use also leads to cognitive impairment, increased agitation, and the use of larger doses to experience a familiar, familiar euphoria. Chronic amphetamine use acts as a neurotoxin, which then slowly poisons its user. Chronic use causes brain damage, leading to memory loss, impaired cognitive function, confusion, paranoia, and extreme mood swings. Additionally, chronic use of amphetamine leads to an extensive damage to the body. Chronic use consequences include severe cardiovascular damage, tics, strokes, dental problems, which then are going to lead to heart problems, organ damage related to malnourishment, and erectile dysfunction. Withdrawal symptoms for chronic amphetamine use include being uneasy in restlessness, insomnia, unpredictable behavior, severe depression, suicidal thoughts, as well as er erratic mood swings. Some things to remember regarding amphetamines. Chronic amphetamine use acts as a neurotoxin on the brain and the central nervous system. This then leads to tics, convulsions, insomnia, restlessness, as well as erectile dysfunction. Amphetamines initially boost focus, energy, and performance, increasing the user's probability of addiction. Malnourishment associated with chronic amphetamine use leads to organ damage, and withdrawal from amphetamines can consist of paranoia, erratic and unpredictable behavior, severe depression, suicidal thoughts, and psychoses. Next, let's go ahead and take a look at the physiological effects of cocaine. Cocaine has a stimuli effect on the brain as well as the central nervous system. Short-term effects of cocaine use include elevated mood, confidence in social settings, a raised sense of self-awareness, sensitivity to physical senses, as well as feeling euphoric. The short-term consequences of cocaine include increased heart rate and blood pressure, increased risk of heart attack, irritability, restlessness and uneasiness, unpredictable and aggressive behavior, and increased risk of seizure and stroke. Cocaine has a short half-life. Now, a half-life is the time it takes for the amount of the drug's active substances in your body to be reduced by half. Cocaine's short half-life then leads to extended use with larger doses, dependency, and addiction. Chronic cocaine use comes with dangerous consequences. Cocaine is significantly going to impact your brain's natural reward system, which in turn makes it more difficult to experience naturally occurring rewards. Difficulty experiencing natural rewards is problematic, especially during withdrawal, and this may result in some mood disorders. Physiologically, chronic cocaine use leads to sinus cavity damage, strokes, seizures, cardiac arrest, as well as psychoses. Especially concerning to medical professionals is binge cocaine use. Binge cocaine use increases the probability of paranoia, panic attacks, delirium with audio hallucinations, and heart attack. So again, some things here to remember regarding cocaine. Binge cocaine use is especially concerning to medical professionals because of the increased risk of panic attacks, paranoia, delirium with audio hallucinations. Extended use of cocaine is going to impact the brain's reward system, making it harder to experience natural rewards. Short, the uh, sh short half-life, I'm sorry, the short half-life of cocaine, and I see that that's wrong in this slide, leads to increased dosages, dependency, and eventually addiction. Chronic cocaine use leads to sinus cavity damage, strokes, seizures, cardiac arrest, and potential psychoses. Lastly, let's go ahead and discuss the physiological effects of cannabis. Now, cannabis has shown to play a role in homeostasis and the neuroplasticity, which is the brain's ability to change and reorganize. Now, part of cannabis is an element called CBD, and the CBD part of cannabis is the one that has been known to have an impact on the brain's ability to change and reorganize. There's a positive effect of CBDs. Now, increased endocannabinoid signaling is associated with reduced stress response, improved emotional regulation, and increased reward signaling. The main psychoactive ingredient in cannabis, THC, stimulates the part of your brain to respond like food and sex. It unleashes dopamine, leading to euphoric and relaxed feelings. 
Now, the consequences of using cannabis um, include the, the THC moving from the bloodstream to the brain and attaching to cannabinoid receptors. This is known as cannabis-induced intoxication. And these cannabinoid receptors where the THC connects or attaches is expressed in high density in the brain areas involving executive function, again, the prefrontal cortex, and your memory, the hippocampus. So the THC, as it breaks the, the bloodstream and goes into your brain, that is where it is found um, in high densities in the brain. THC is going to, again, alter the hippocampus, the brain's area responsible for memory formation and processing that information. We may have known, you may have known, we all may have known some people who are chronic cannabis users. They are forgetful. They forget things. Um, it's part of it because, again, the THC is going to be in high density around the hippocampus. Now, with chronic cannabis use, the users can expect subsequent cognitive decline in executive functioning and verbal intelligence. Intellectual deficits and effect are affected by processing speeds. So I did some research when I was getting ready to do this course, and, and what the researchers have found is that chronic cannabis users over extended periods of time, decades, they're going to lose verbal intelligence, verbal IQ. They're going to have problems explaining things, telling stories, and it's part of the way that the cannabis affects the brain. There, again, is no question that cannabis can lead to short-term problems with thinking, working memory, executive function, or the psychomotor function. Some studies have shown cannabis use can trigger psychotic symptoms, potentially longer-lasting problems, and even late-onset psychoses. Psychosis is a severe mental condition in which a person's thoughts and their emotions are so affected that they lose contact and lose reality, lose contact with the reality that they're in. Experts agree that individuals with a history or a family history of psychosis should certainly avoid cannabis as it can be exasperating or worsening the psychosis. Now, what I found when I was doing my research preparing for this class is that um, mental health professionals have found that People prone to mental illness like psychoses tend to self-medicate, so they, they drink or they use drugs. So it's kind of difficult for them to determine if the psychoses has been developed because of cannabis or because it was in the family. But what they have seen is that cannabis is going to, or it can trigger longer lasting psychoses or even on that psychosis, on uh, late onset psychoses. Now, despite what many believe, cannabis use can be problematic as it may lead you to a cannabis use disorder. And you can see right there, CUD, cannabis use disorder. Some important things to remember about cannabis. Driving under the influence of cannabis is concerning because its ability to delay cognitive function. Again, the THC is going to camp on the prefrontal cortex as well as the hippocampus, and that's gonna delay your cognitive function. Short-term cannabis use can be shown to impair a user's memory, Psychosis is an adverse effect cannabis has on some users, not all, but some. And chronic cannabis use can be shown to impair cognitive function, especially related to memory. Again, the THC kind of camps out on your prefrontal cortex as well as your hippocampus. So that's going to wrap up the first module of five modules. So after this, you're going to see there's some YouTube clips you're going to watch. And at the end of this module, there's going to be a short assessment. Um, if you have any questions or any concerns, again, my name is Paul Fernandez. You can call the office and reach me or send me an email at Paul Fernandez at Arizona DUI Services. I appreciate your time. I hope you learned some things. Take care. Have a great day.